Once upon a time, I was a little boy, and beauty was all around me, and I knew it. The towering trees, the crunching forest floor, that, that fresh, crisp smell, it was magical. That magic, it slowly died through the years. That magic that I felt such a deep part of me, it just slowly faded away. This is the story of getting that magic back. I was 12 years old when my parents decided it was time to remodel the house. It was a small one-story home, and before I knew it, these guys in hard hats showed up and they ripped the place apart. Concrete was oozing out of trucks into trenches, and there was the, the smell of sawdust in the air. It was, it was so cool. <laughs> I wanted to be part of that, so I borrowed the contractor's plans. I took them back to my fort and I drew all over them. The next morning I woke up and the contractor was yelling at my dad. My dad turned around and he said, when I get home, you and I are going to have a talk. Well, I knew I had a grim punishment coming to me, but what made matters worse, because my, my dad was really good at this parent thing, he, he made me wait all day to find out what it was. <laughs> that evening he drove in the driveway and, uh, and he said, come with me. So he went around the back of his car and, and uh, he said, open the trunk. And I thought, okay. So open the trunk and there's a big box in there. And we take it out, we carry it inside. I open it up, it's a drafting table and a T-square and a stool. And we set it up and he puts paper down and he says, if you want to draw, you'll draw right here. Well, that was it for me. I knew from that day forward that I wanted to be an architect. So many drawings and paintings and projects as a kid. They made people smile. Parents, teachers, friends. I just remember people being happy and that made me happy. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make beautiful things that made people happy. So what is beauty? Why does beauty really matter? Well, go with me here. Close your eyes. Imagine a world, our world, without beauty. What does that look like? Gray, no color, no Mozart or Van Gogh, no museums, right? We wouldn't need that. What's, what's the most beautiful thing that you ever beheld before you? That, that would be gone too, right? This is a difficult world to imagine. Okay, open your eyes. I know what you're thinking. He's an architect and his livelihood depends on beauty. But I truly believe that without beauty in our lives, we as the human race would cease to exist. There would be oxygen, there'd be sunlight, there'd be food and water, but without beauty, natural beauty and constructed beauty, our lives would be meaningless. We would slowly cease to have a reason, a purpose to, to live. Throughout most of human history, Beauty has been a centered and revered part of our existence. Shakespeare, Michelangelo, da Vinci, they and so many more saw beauty as their greatest inspiration. And their attempt to capture and to glorify it as their greatest quest and responsibility. Few would argue that the most prolific and uplifting time of, of human existence was the Renaissance, a three-century-long period dedicated almost exclusively to the recognition and the proliferation of beauty. Now, I studied the Renaissance in high school, but the real world, my world, it didn't look a lot like what the Renaissance was all about. I wanted to fit in like everyone else, so in addition to my not-so-cool creative inclinations, I, I tried to keep up with my brothers and friends who were great athletes. I made the team, but I rode the pine. Coach didn't play me much. We did have beautiful cheerleaders, though, and that was a good thing. But I, I learned pretty quickly in, that an artistic boy in high school was not going to have an easy road. I was reminded of that several times. Eventually, I became an architect. I got married. We had a family. Things got complicated. 
You know, the, the responsibilities of being a parent and getting kids from one game to another, bosses and then employees, a, a mortgage and then a financial crisis, you know the picture. Save for my wife and kids and our annual camping trip, beauty, it just sort of faded away, disappeared, kind of like dialing down the dimmer on my beauty switch until it, it just clicked off. I said my beauty switch. Yep, the beauty switch. I like to think that you and I have a bank of switches within us. We've got a switch for hunger, a switch for lust, a switch for fight or flight, and we have a switch for beauty. Yep, the beauty switch. Right there with the other switches on the breaker panel of your life. Our switches get tripped by various events in our lives, sometimes abruptly, sometimes gradually. We're pretty good at reaching inside and accessing that inner breaker panel and flicking those switches back on, but the beauty switch is, I think it's become an elusive one. It's a, little, it's a little harder out there. My beauty switch, it just gradually faded away. I think it was a mixture of responsibility and maturity, media and technology. I'm not really sure. I didn't even realize it went off. There are plenty of reasons our beauty switches get turned off. It's pretty noisy out there. But what interests me more is what turns your beauty switch on. For some of my friends, it's the magic of music, patterns and harmony. For others, it's that book or the poetry and the writing. For many of my friends, it's a picturesque golf course or the way food is arranged on the plate in that savory first bite. The common ingredient, as I see it, is that we yearn for our senses to be delighted for the anticipation of that savory first bite, or a view so majestic that it takes our breath away, or a song that reaches deep into our soul and makes it dance. This delight is deep within you. It's not skin deep at all. Now for me, visual beauty is my switch, and nature is the underlying ingredient for this beauty. The flora, the fauna, the power of nature, and it's the beauty that we construct, the beauty that we bring into this world that's based on natural beauty, influenced by it, the ionic capital that has been carved in stone for the millenniums, that new museum that is now becoming the pride in the center of town, the sinuous lines of a classic car. The beauty that we construct, carved, painted, put together by us, it comes from nature, sometimes mimicking, sometimes contrasting. And when we're coming from beauty in these ways, I think that we're at our best. Now, my beauty switch had been off for some time. I, uh, I know that because it went off, I... I thought everything was fine. The practice was, my architectural practice was moving along. Uh, we were making clients happy, designing buildings, winning awards. We had magazine articles, but I wasn't sensing the purposeful career that I envisioned for myself. I knew something was missing. I just didn't know what it was. And then this project came along. A lot of projects came and went, but this particular home, we had a wonderful client with an incredible property high up on the hill overlooking the entire city. And a carte blanche ticket to do something really special here. What we came up with was good. The client thought it was great. But I go home at night and I think to myself, you know, it's good, but it's not great. It's a pretty home and it's a beautiful hill, but they weren't connecting. I felt like that home could be anywhere on that hill or any hill for that matter. I was frustrated. Right around this time, I took a trip with my 10-year-old son. It was more of a pilgrimage, really, to Bear Run, Pennsylvania, to see Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Falling Water, the 1930s modern masterpiece that is just so stunning. This home has, at its roots, a connection to nature that is so profound, it literally floats out over the, the water 
and the balconies are almost extending and cantilevering out as if the water was water falling over them. The boulders poke up through the floor and become furniture. Frank was so good. <laughs> After a planes, trains, and automobiles trek to get there, we rounded the bend and uh, the, the, uh, parked the car, rounded the bend, came in the driveway, and, and I stopped. There was the house before me. My son, he looks up to me and he says, Dad, why are you crying? And I, I looked down at him and I said, because it's just so beautiful. Somehow on that fateful pilgrimage between my tears and the amazement of what was before me and the knowledge that I was sharing the importance of beholding beauty with my son, my pilot light flickered on on my beauty switch. Little flame. And I was on the way home, the flame got brighter, and when I got back to the office, I realized what was wrong. We were not connecting this house with nature, the underlying principle of what I knew was beauty. And when we started to take the house and undulate the walls with the site and work it together, and the house became the hill, and the hill became the house, and this, the city lights below, and it, it just was magical. Bells ringing, high fives from the project team, hugs from the clients, clouds party. Oh! <laughs> Beauty is what makes delight. And delight is what makes us happy. And happiness, as we know, is essential for a meaningful existence. That is why beauty is a part of you, and why it's natural for you to share it, to pass it along. You are an essential ingredient in this beauty ecosystem. It's in us and it's all around us, and when we live our life and our work and connect it to nature and natural surroundings, and we share and proliferate this beauty, there is a, a delight, a magic, a happiness that cannot be denied. That is beauty to me. What is your beauty? Thank you.